So hello everyone and welcome to the seventh Students for Critical Animal Studies Conference. I am Nathan Poirier, a doctoral candidate in sociology at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan, United States. I will be the facilitator for today's event. So the Institute for Critical Animal Studies or ICAS is an anarchist theory to action activist organization that aims to bring together radical scholar activists of all stripes and from all causes together to dismantle all systems of domination and oppression in the pursuit of total liberation, which is liberation for humans, non-human animals, and the environment. So Students for Critical Animal Studies, or SCAS, is the student branch of ICAS devoted to raising student scholar activist voices in the tradition of critical animal studies more generally. So this uh, event is being held in April of 2022, and April also, also marks the, uh, the month of publication for the uh, Combahee River Collective Statement. And in particular, this year, 2022, is the 45th anniversary of this important radical intersectional document. So I want to um, uh, acknowledge that um, um, sort of uh, event. Um, an anniversary, and I'll, I'll put a link to the, the Combahee River Collective statement in the chat for anyone who maybe hasn't read it or would like to reread it on the 45th anniversary. So two things to note about how this uh, event is going to go today. Um, the first is that presenters will have 20 minutes to present. Um, each presentation will have 20 minutes to present, and then that will be immediately followed by a 10 minute Q&A session for that presentation. Uh, so we would like to ask that all questions for presenters are typed into the Q&A feature of Zoom, and that should be located with an icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, so other than questions for presenters after a given presentation, all other comments should be typed into the chat box, um, which also has an icon at the bottom of your screen. So we do welcome uh, friendly and constructive criticism, but we do ask that all comments are kept respectful because the point of critical animal studies is to be a mutually supportive organization. We are here to um, help each other and support each other, um, not add any more negativity into what already exists. So to try to keep on schedule, um, that's all I have for introductory comments and we can move on to our first uh, presenter. So that is, let me just get to my info here. That will be Linda Korambakis. And uh, Linda will be talking, presenting about the Student Vegan Society. So, Linda, we're all set when you are. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that I might be the exception to the QA rule um, because I can't stay in my presentation is much shorter than others. Um, so if anyone has any questions um, while I'm chatting away, which is only going to be for 10 minutes, you can just put those in the chat and I'll try and keep one eye on that as well and answer where possible. I will turn my video off because it affects my PowerPoint presentation and I'm looking to share my screen in a moment. Um, what I'm really going to talk about before this comes up, I don't know why it's not sharing now, it was working fine earlier. Um, what um, I'm looking to do is to uh, have a quick discussion about the student journal of vegan sociology in particular but um just really why it's important that we all support each other in trying to get our work out there particularly when you're still a student it's not the easiest thing to do um it's sometimes a little bit daunting and the point of our um journal um was to uh let me just see hopefully you can see that now or in a moment the point of the journal was to make this a little bit more accessible for everyone. Can you all see that now? I'm hoping so. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so um, that's our wonderful front cover, which was uh, drawn by an activist in Romania. Um, and we're trying to make a vegan sociology, well, first of all, I'll explain what vegan sociology is. I see there's a lot of sociologists on the panel today, and I presume that maybe a lot of the students may be too. But just in case, I thought I would start with what sociology actually is, um, if you were just to explain this to someone who's uh, not got a clue and just thinks all ologies are very complicated and full of quantitative data. So um, 
it is the study of society, which is straightforward enough if you just break it down, but what society is is a little bit more complex. So I've kind of explained that in this slide. I'm not going to read the slide because you, you guys are capable of doing that yourselves, but essentially it's this um, uh, investigation into how our everyday experiences as individuals and groups are shaped by the structures and systems and institutions um, that we are subjected to and that we grow up within and that we learn how to be um, members of our society from. Um, so there are some culturally specific elements to this, but things are also relative to space and time. So what was okay 10 years ago is not okay now and so on and so forth. And I would say that veganism is something that's become a lot more culturally acceptable and socially normative than ever before, which since um, 1999, when I first went vegan, is uh, most welcome. Um, C. Wright Mills uh, was very clear when he was talking about the sociological imagination that the task and promise of sociology should be to challenge and to investigate where things have come from and how um, we can maybe use that to, to make changes for the better, which is really why most of us are here. So as I say, if you've got any questions, you can bung them in the chat. Um, vegan sociology in particular links to, um, well, everything, <laughs> really. You guys will know that um, most, of the, most of the talks today are about um, some kind of uh, intersectionality, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, um, um, but also because sociology traditionally has been mostly anthropocentric, vegan sociology is very, very keen to make sure that there's um, an inclusion for other individuals and groups from non-human animal species, not just the human species. So that said, even the word species is a problem, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, there's a variety of different ways of doing this because inequality and injustice affects everyone. Um, however, as most sociologists will know, and certainly anyone else that's studying the human condition, will know there's generally a, 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 a source of most of the suppression, and it comes from higher up and power and, and greed and capitalism and the industrial complex in some shape or form. So what I've said down at the bottom here is that because non-humans are overlooked, what vegan sociology does is apply the vegan ethic to sociological practice and uh, academia to make sure that they're considered. There are some other um, uh, disciplines that do that, but we're trying to make this uh, specifically vegan. And that will also include veganism itself as an identity, as a way of expressing an ethic and a lived experience and what that can be like. And my own research is looking at what, um, how, what it's like for vegan children um, in uh, the, the structures and systems that we have in Scotland, at least. Uh, that's my starting point. Um, hopefully this will go on to the next slide. I'm grateful as ever. Um, linked to ICAS, of course, is JCAS, and that was the first time I was able to publish a piece of work that came from my anthrozoology uh, master's at Exeter. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to get some feedback, and this is really, I suppose, the point of the Student Journal for Vegan, so of Vegan Sociology. It's not often that there's someone that will hear what you're trying to say without judging it before they've even started, right? A lot of, again, getting back to sociology being predominantly um, anthropocentric and, and this idea that really, you know, if you're not talking about people, what's the point? Um, uh, this is what the, the, the journals come from. And it's come from um, IAVS, the, the Vegan Sociology Association. The first of its kind, although, like I say, GCAS has existed, but, and while a lot of it is sociological, we're trying to maintain that sociology only. We launched our first, um, volume in November and uh, we're in the process of peer reviewing volume two though through illness there's been a bit of a delay so if any of you had submitted and I'm not sure who did because we've anonymized everything two months ago and I forget um I apologize for that but yeah sometimes when you are a student of uh, if you're a vegan student if you're an abolitionist or liberatory student um there's nowhere for you to put your work until you're maybe in a PhD and even then so it's another outlet for that and it is peer reviewed and um, you know, we have the, the, the faculty of very experienced people behind us. Um, we're always looking for translator, volunteer translators, interest, and incidentally to translate our abstracts so that um, we can make the journal more accessible to more people worldwide. Here's the articles that we had in volume one. So as you can see, there's quite a, 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 a range of different topics um, all linked to. We, we made sure through peer review they were all um, specifically vegan, um, 
and, and, and adhere to the, the ethics that, that go along with that and sociological, of course. So it goes from some um, uh, queer theory through to criminology, through to um, uh, experiential um, studies. So um, the best one I know about is my own, and that was interesting trying to have that as the editor of the journal, try, <laughs> trying to put my, my piece of work through without anybody knowing it was mine and hoping it didn't get rejected at the first <laughs> hurdle, which it didn't, thankfully. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that to give you an example of how we can apply um, sociology through veganism to animal liberation and, and um, emancipation, which is why we're all doing what we're doing. So very briefly, because I'm aware of my time and I'm trying to keep on, um, animal rights, animal lib activists have always been criminalised. Um, there have been swathes of that being stronger in the press, depending on what else is happening. But this um, idea of um, us being, I'm saying us, maybe that doesn't apply to everyone, so I apologise if it doesn't, but the, the deviance, you know, deviance is just something out with the norm. So when it isn't the norm to think that it's OK to rescue, um, uh, non-humans from real awful conditions, then that's quite easy to demonize because it is um, activity that people think is um, uh, really scary for some reason. And I think maybe the masks and stuff um, have contributed to that. <laughs> Who would have thought that in a world of two years of pandemic where masks are now expected, um, maybe it's less so now. But very frequently, there's the label of terrorism that's applied to this. And of course, in terms of semantics and you know the use of language generally, um, that's another um, part of sociology that can be investigated too and is um, frequently. The real crimes that I would say anyway are overlooked are crimes that are legal. Um, mutilating individuals with no anaesthetic, not even allowing the basics of shelter, and that is just even cover, never mind food and water, and the practices that go in slaughterhouses, as well as many other things. Again, these are discussed in the paper if you want to read it, and it's open access too, so you can. But these aren't unlawful. And yet, when you try to rescue a being from that kind of situation, you're considered terrorist and, and that your activity is unlawful. One way to look at this is through the eyes of um, some classical critical criminological theory. That's a lot of alliteration. So in the paper, in, in, the, in the journal anyway, and, and many others, this is one way to do it. And if you teach or if you're involved with, you know, if you're, you've got a classical class in uni and you're looking to try and include what your beliefs are, one way to do that is to apply a standard classical theory to the issues that interest you. So that's what this paper did very briefly because it wasn't very long, but um, you know, you can make a folk devil out of anyone um, and the press as um, instruments of capitalism, you could argue, um, are quite good at that, creating a moral panic. Oh no, there's all these people and they're wondering about with balaclavas in the middle of the night and um, this is terrible. And actually it's not terrible. It's rescuing beings from harm. That's not terrible. Um, there's some classical Marxist ideas when you think, I mean, if, if um, what is considered criminal is defined by the state and the state is influenced by the capitalists or the industries that are making the money from that, those acts, then clearly that's going to be, um, uh, there's plenty of fodder to, um, to talk about there. Uh, there's a new social theory, Taylor Walton and Young, it's not that new anymore, it's decades old about what deviance is and and, um, and a lot of these things are just deviance is what people define it as. So therefore it can be redefined, right? Um, there's an example at the bottom of the page. I'm conscious of my time, so I'm sorry if I'm rattling on too quickly, but um, very recently in the UK, we have had an animal sentience committee appointed, do you think? And this was met with, you know, this was lauded. This is going to be great. People are recognizing sentience. That's wonderful. But actually in practice, <laughs> um, the 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 sentence of the animal has not meant that it's then excluded from harm all it's meant is that somebody's going to discuss discuss whether or not you can improve slaughter welfare and death is death right so um the fact that they feel pain and suffering um when they're killed or just before they're killed is irrelevant um so this animal sentence committee is is worthless and therefore um to continue to criminalize people that are against this is is um always very interesting um, to wrap up, <laughs> um, this is what it comes down to, and it comes down to property and things that people own, ownership, um, uh, 
ownership of property, whether that property is bricks and mortar, or whether that property is the are the um, animals contained within that bricks and mortar. Either way, it's protected in law. However, um, there's terrorism defined, the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or property in furtherance of political um, objectives, right? So there's a huge philosophical debate about personhood and whether certain species of animal have or have, have don't have it. So if you take that out of the equation, non-human animals within these um, institutions are still considered property because it's property damage and theft and all that kind of stuff that's, that's um, charged against people who liberate. So why are they not protected as property then in the same way as the bricks and mortar that surround them are protected? So again, the application of these things uh, it all comes back to this. It's all about the cash. Um, and what vegan sociology does is allow us to um, apply this, apply the, the, the theory that people already maybe are familiar with, or maybe come up with a new theory, the theory, there's nothing wrong with that. But apply these theories to things that they've maybe never thought about before. Like I did with the Peppa Pig paradox. Why is it that nobody thought that eating a bacon sandwich while watching Peppa Pig with a little dress on that's got, why is that not a problem for people? It's just to get people to think more. And people are thinking more and people are more critical. And it's our job to make sure that that continues. So <laughs> I've rattled on a little bit there. I hope I've made some sense. Thanks very much for listening. Um, and if anyone has any, I'm just having a quick look in the chat. I don't think there's any specific um, queries. Uh, Nate's put up the link to the journal in there so you can read that my article and all the others that were there and they're fantastic I have to say. Um, one other thing to add is that the students who submitted whether they were successful in being chosen for the journal or not all commented on how helpful the process they found it really inclusive really supportive which is what we're trying to do because we're all in this together as Nate said earlier we should be supporting each other to become the best um, uh, activist academics we can be right so um, the, the journal is for that, as um, uh, JCAS is for, um, and it's really wonderful that, that these conferences are still happen and they're still well attended and hopefully people will watch these things after. If you've got any questions about the journal, that's my, I think it's, you call it my, I call it my handle. Is that the right word? I don't know. I'm a bit old. Um, and that's LM Corin Bocas, um, so let's say L for Linda. Uh, feel free to find me on Twitter or, or Facebook or anything if you've got any questions. Um, or you can contact me through um, Nathan as well. Um, happy to take, oh, wait a minute, I'm just checking the chat. Um, question there about, uh, yeah, what I learned about my research about vegan children. I'll just um, close my, uh, stop sharing my screen to answer that. If I've, have I got time to answer that, Nate? I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, so Linda, okay. I was, I was going to, I mean, just, yeah, just sort of comment on how your situation was a little yeah. different than others. Yeah, just sorry, because I've of circumstances totally and getting sped through here. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, is it would it be okay, Linda, if you answer that just in the chat, and that yeah, we could sure. we could of we course. could move on because yeah, Absolutely. It, it is a little unfortunate, but yeah, just circumstances no, that's behind fine. the scenes with getting Linda involved. That's that's yeah. okay, and and thanks for having me. And like I say, um, this isn't uh, the journal is not in any kind of competition with any other journal. It's another outlet for, um, or another potential outlet for work that you're probably doing as part of coursework, whether it's um. I mean, I don't know if it'd be classed as an appropriate outlet for a paper if you're wanting to pub, uh, do PhD by publication. It's maybe not fancy enough. Um, but our, our idea is really just to include everyone, um, be supportive of everyone, and make sure that there's more, more of this stuff getting out and about. And it's open access, of course, as well on that basis. Thank you for having me, and I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Linda. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have the, the student-centered um, uh, journal and, um, and that, that, that you're involved with at the student-centered conference here. So it's a really nice, really nice presentation. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to our next presenter, which is, um, who is Esgi Karoglu. And Esgi's presentation is titled, Infrastructural Approach to Urban Street Animals of Istanbul, Contestation, Violence, Affectivity, and Spatial Visibility in Metropolis. So whenever you're ready, Eski. Yeah, I, I try to share my screen, of course. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. 
So I wonder what do you see? I, yeah, Chrome. I see your whole screen. We see okay. it. The PowerPoint. Right now, uh, it's probably getting there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, looks like it's in presentation mode now. So okay, good. I'm left. So okay, I think I'm ready. Yeah. So hi again, everyone. I'm SD Carollo. I'm third year PhD student in the Department of Sociology at MSU, Michigan State University. So before I start, I wanna share a brief background story of this paper. So um, I was born and grew up in Istanbul, Turkey, the city which I really love and enjoy living in. In 2019, I decided to start the grad school and move to the US, or at least I thought that I moved to the US, but then as we all know, the pandemic happened and I got, I got back to Istanbul in March, 2020 and lived there uh, for one and a half year again. So like many places around the globe, we were under very long curfews, streets were isolated, and the only thing I do outside was the morning and sundown jogging along the seaside. So because there were very few people outside, the stray animals, their struggle and the, their interaction with the space in the unusually abundant streets of the city were very striking. Everything was very striking at that point in the, in the time, but yeah, uh, in the meantime, I was taking a class on a state of violence where we read a lot about state-sponsored infrastructure and slow violence. And I decided to think critically about the stray animals as a human citizen of the city who read a bit about this stuff. So this paper is just a genuine effort to share my experience and perspective with you and kind of a naive step into animal studies field, which is not my main field of research, but sort of my academic and non-academic pleasure. Since it's not my main field, as I said, I usually do not read on that bulk of literature. Therefore, I'm open to hear and any, hear any contributions, comments, suggestions, critics, whatever you want to share. So just a quick note, unless otherwise noted, the photos are taken by me in Istanbul in the fall of 2020. So um, I'm gonna start with two stories that might give you a sense of stray animals, interactions with the city and the citizens. So on the left side, you see Boji, uh, who is known as the Istanbul's commuter dog. Last year, Boji became famous after making rounds every day on all means of mass transit across the city. Although he loved by the millions with his viral photos and videos, Boji became a target of a smear campaign when a photo of photo on social media showed the animal defecating on the seat of the tram he was traveling on. However, security camera footage revealed that an unknown man had purposefully placed canine poop on the seat. After this incident, Boji was sheltered in an animal care center by Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality and recently found home in the premises of one of the biggest business families of Turkey. So on the right side, you are seeing Gili. Gili was a was the resident of Hagia Sophia in the very heart of Istanbul. Built in 537 in the Roman Empire era, Hagia Sophia served as a church and museum over the years and reopened as a mosque in 2020 as one of the urban transformation policies of the conservative authoritarian regime in Turkey. Gli witnessed the recent transformation of Hagia Sophia until she passed away at the age of 16 on November 8, 2020. Her death was announced by the governor of Istanbul in his Twitter account. Even though those two animal residents of Istanbul who engage in the mundane life of the city are the center of public attention, approximately 130,000 dogs and 125,000 cats roam free in Istanbul alongside over 16 million human denizens of the city who have not received some same kind of attention and care from the state officials. So my argument is kind of like quite clear and short. City becomes a contested space for inclusion and exclusion of interspecies relation in the absence or inefficiency of the protective law for the animals as a form of state-sponsored violence. While formal shelters and streets are a space for exclusion, inclusive spaces are created through the art carved in the landscape of the metropolis and the informal structures built by the citizens. 
I borrow mainly from anthropology literature on state violence to frame the theoretical background and connect them with the experiences in Istanbul. But I believe that the framework might be applicable to anywhere else where there is a state and where there is a state that neglects some of its members. So, um, yeah. So Larkin describes, so I present a brief overview of different approaches to infrastructures in order to provide an avenue to discuss the infrastructural violence that the street animals of Istanbul are exposed to. Larkin describes infrastructures as youth networks that facilitate the flow of goods, people, or ideas and allow for their exchange over space. They compromise, comprise architecture for circulation, literally providing the underbuilding under of modern societies, and they generate the ambient environment of everyday life. So while infrastructures are promising when they provide hope, they are detrimental when they perpetuate exclusion, they can cause harm and grief when they serve as a tool of state-sponsored sponsored neglect and abjection. And those are, those may ex exacerbate inequalities and discrimination and violence that manifest slow and structural ways. A variety of spaces can be the location of infrastructural violence from detention centers and camps to entire cities. Artistic production can provide avenues for making the violence visible and, and effectively felt. I try to make tangible this scholarly work in my paper. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna start with so i'm gonna i'm gonna make this like scholarly work tangible in this like four steps like the law the law and legislation the state run shelters informal resident made structures and artistic landscape and i'm gonna start with the law and legislation so um so yeah humans and animals have always shared the city of istanbul from the from the Ottoman Empire era, and even before, of course. So animals in Istanbul have been subject to several fate or absence regulations. For instance, in, in 1910s, nearly 11,000 street dogs of Istanbul were deported, deported to deserted islands of the coast of Istanbul. With the enactment of the Animal Welfare Act in misdemeanor law in, in 2014, torture, abuse, and general mistreatment of all street animals became a misdemeanor subject to fines. However, because the Animal Welfare Act does not involve in Turkish criminal law, no abuser can be sued, judged, and fined in the court system. So there is a no kill, no caption policy for, uh, for the street animals in Turkey. But with the efforts of the local government and citizens, they are caught, neutralized, and are released back to the location that they were caught. That, that they were caught. But since the number is overwhelming, the efforts are, efforts are not sufficient. The new law came out in 2021 just to protect the animals who are commodified and under the possession of the humans, not the animals who run freely, who run freely in the streets of Istanbul or in general Turkey. So the law is not from a genuine animal welfare perspective. It just like protect the commodified animals, let's say. So of course there is a large and strong body of non-governmental and activist organization who make advocacy for animal liberation and animal rights and the management of street animals. The management of street animals is always controversial issue in Turkey and the law and the efforts fall short to provide sustainable protection to street animals. So there are, um, I'm just gonna like briefly talk about the animal shelters. In Istanbul, there are 39 local, 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 locally governed rehabilitation and care centers in quotations, but they're basically animal shelters with very poor conditions. They are mostly in the unreachable peripheries of, of Istanbul and overpopulated and diseases are impacting the well-being of the animals. So state-run shelters tangibly encapsulate the infrastructural violence that street animals are exposed to, but they are not the sole representations of it. Without the robust protection mechanisms and with increasing number of crimes against the street animals, including murder, torture, and even sexual harassment, the streets of Istanbul are spaces where the violence in the shelter is expanded into. In the absence of a protective legal structure, the fate and welfare of the street animals are abandoned to the will, consciousness, and capability of the denizens, which occasionally make the streets safe for the non-human residents of Istanbul. 
So there's a lot to talk about in many nuanced ways about this issue, but I don't want to get going that much details. Uh, but main message that the main message that I want to deliver here is kind of the legal structure does not protect the animals and the place and place the responsibility on the citizens of the city. So uh, residents made informal infrastructures are one of the main forms making the caring relation between humans and non-humans in Istanbul. While not necessarily well constructed and sufficient as you see uh, in the picture here, in every, you can see them in every corner of the city. So this informal resident made structures are kind of, so they are made by the leftover rocks and brick of construction site. There's some more photos here, I'm gonna show you. Yeah, like, as you see, there are some bricks there, some clothes that cover the shelters blanket some of the building blocks of these structures and there's a even a yard container and there's also like as you see there's a laundry bag something like that so uh, through these resident made sponsored infrastructures seed animals are provided with relatively safe spaces for sleeping resting feeding their babies and are fed and watered However, they fall short of establishing a healthy and durable solution of caring for all the street animals in the long run, since their individual informal attempts are not, are not sustainable. And in the nexus of state-sponsored violence and effective caring of the denizens, the artistic representations of the street animals of Istanbul are essential components of the urban landscape. Some of this visual work in a are reminded of the significance of non-human life in Istanbul. Others constitute awareness raising for state-sponsored violence against these animals. As coined by Murphy, memory mapping works to develop effective visual maps of the relations between the bodies, lived experiences, and memories neglected in the official narratives. So moreover, these visual maps induce effective witnessing and knowing of human rights violations by making temporal and spatial connections between them. Here, in my case, the, the subjects are not human, but still they are subject to rights violations. So there are two cases that I want to share. So the, the trajectories of artistic activism can be followed through two examples from the mundane urban life of Istanbul. So this is a study of uh, Tarchin. Tarchin means ginger in English. Um, so, and also there is Tommy. Tommy, yeah, Tommy is as known as com companion of the cats. So, those two st statues are erected on the Asian side of Istanbul, who lost their lives in car collisions. All of these animals were in, in a very close daily relationship with the human residents of the city. Tragically, 18-year-old Tarchin was killed by a hit and run drive, by a hit and run car crash who was going in the wrong direction. Yet the perpetrator was not even attempted to be found and punished justly. With these statues erected in their erected in their exact residency, the human neighbors are able to convey their gratitude to them and the shared memories, as well as drawing attention to the animal abuse and failures in the welfare law. So Tommy is kind of have similar fate that Tarchin. He was also uh, murdered by a car crash. So the presence of the studios is a form of visual activism against violations of non-human rights, the bodies and lived experiences of street animals as non-human residents of the city. The memories they involve are being constantly neglected and violated by the state. These statues invite the viewer of we were to effective seeing and knowing of state-sponsored violence addressing the street animals in Istanbul. So as the picture of both statues illustrate here, Tarchin and Tommy are still the residents of their neighborhood with their non-human and human company, companions around them. So yeah, putting Murphy's concept of memory mapping that allows drawing temporal and special connections between neglected bodies, lived experiences and memories in the dominant narrative, the conservations, conser conversation with Nixon, the description of infrastructures as built networks that facilitate the flow of people, goods or ideas over time and space and generate the ambient environment of everyday life. 
So as another example, example in line with Larkin's definition of infrastructures, generators of ambient environment in daily life, the graffiti depicting street animals is tied to extremely mundane urban spaces of Istanbul. So the wall of an open air parking lot in Istanbul and electric box or a front side of a random, random regular apartment are apartment building. So this one graffiti list, yeah, so I'm gonna give more details about this. So this one graffiti is illustrates a man with his, if you, if you have a chance to look at this frame, uh, illustrating this man with his dog and he's reading a, a book about, which is called Journey, Beautiful Journey with Luna, I guess. And so, I mean, in this, uh, graffiti it's still like the dog is still uh, captured as the commodity of the a human being but still it's kind of like um, kind of the animal representation in the uh, urban infrastructures that they are the buildings so put differently the image of image images of the street animals become visible not only by covering the bad looking urban infrastructures like the walls of a parking lot or an electric box they also make the random, in, random infrastructures memorable with their presence. In Larkinian terms, they generate an ambient environment in, the, in daily life where interactions take place. So this paper takes a snapshot of the different mundane forms of infrastructural violence that the street animals of Istanbul are exposed to, drawing on anthropological literature on slow, stru slow structural and infrastructural violence I conclude that these concepts are applicable to explain the mismanagement of the street animals in Istanbul and its manifestation in the urban life of metropolis. The street animals as the representatives of daily life are the subjects of systematic and gradual exclusion and objection to infrastructures built by the state. The failed law and state-run shelters are tools of the state state-run infrastructural violence and the violence disseminate even beyond the state-run shelters to the streets of Istanbul. With that, Metropolis becomes, a, becomes an enormous space for violence with its corners and edges. The space is contested, though <laughs> while exclusion and objection are present, it's, it also reserves interaction points of caring and effective seeing through the informal infrastructures and artistic pieces covering the landscape of the city. So yeah, I'm not saying here that the capacity and the conditions of the shelters should be improved. Rather, I argue for organized, inclusive, and state-sponsored support for the betterment of life of the street animals roaming free in the public urban spaces. As Anand asserts, the objection of urban infrastructures defines the relationship between the government and the governed and that determines the denied residents of the city. Because the animals and humans share the city, as I present here, there's a, there is a strong and established interspecies relationship in the city. It should be supported by the well-established infrastructures and law. So finally, I want to thank uh, a few people here. So Dr. Laura Rees uh, from Urban and Regional Planning Department at MSU, who gave several reads to this paper. Dr. Elizabeth Rexler, who taught the course that I wrote, that I wrote this paper for. And my peers, Kelsey Wagner and Emma Dublewski from the Department of Anthropology, they also read this paper and provide constructive feedbacks. And my friend Astia Slidon from uh, Sociology Department at UT Austin. They all gave very gentle but constructive feedbacks for the improvement of this paper. And also, I want to thank my animal best friend, Pixel, for preventing me to forget the moral dilemmas of interspecies relations every day, every single day. So, thank you. I'm open to every comments, critics, whatever you want to share. I appreciate them just in advance. All right, thank you so much, Eski. Um, okay, yeah, so we do have we do have the time for um, Q and A for Eski. So I, I do want to reiterate that for attendees, I guess attendees have to put the quite well. I mean, I would like to ask attendees to um, enter your questions in the Q and A specifically, but panelists, I believe, can't access the the Q and A and have to use the chat. So that that's kind of annoying. And I guess if that doesn't if the Q and A doesn't work out, we can deal with that. But um, Okay, so just to reiterate that, but we do 
I do have a question. Um, oh, trying to read this. So, Ezra, you, you might be able to see this, but just just so we're all clear. Um, so, Dion's asking, how is the situation of animals different in other urban spaces such as um, Ankara? Yeah. So, I mean, my my answer will be probably like it's not super different because, but Istanbul is just the case that I kind of like capture this relationship. So in most of the urban spaces in, in Turkey, the situation is almost the same. And, but the, you know, like the population in Istanbul and the, the, the human and non-human population in Istanbul is kind of the, uh, like a bit more than Ankara and kind of Istanbul is kind of the attention of the center of the attention for uh, like the representations of what's going on in the entire country. So if something happened in Istanbul, it just like reflects the entire country. It's kind of an egocentric uh, perspective maybe, but that's why, and also I, I kind of, I mean, I'm an Istanbul native. So this is the reason that I picked and I spent, and as the, like, uh, like the story that I told at the beginning, it's kind of the, uh, my memo memo memoir, let's say from, for the pandemic. But yeah, the situation is not super different, almost the same. The relations with, between the urban, between the non-human and humans in the urban spaces. So, yeah. Excellent, thanks. So other questions for Esgi? Realize it can take some time to think or to type them up. Um, Esgi, I wanted to ask because a couple of years ago, we had a couple of students present on situations in Turkey as well. Um, and so one of the things I remember uh, from their presentations and some sequent book chapters is that Istanbul recently, and this is what I want to check, but I think recently or most recently um, came under left-wing leadership. Is that still the case in, um, in Istanbul? Is the left-wing party still in control there? Mm, yeah, the leftist parties, I mean, not leftist, but leftist compared to the, <laughs> the, uh, the other. Yeah. yeah, the other, but it, they're kind of like they identify as central leftist or whatever. But anyways, but it's like still better than the, uh, the our, like general government, let's say. So, yeah, but the situation is, uh, I mean, I, I talk about the street animals here, but street animals are uh, just cats and dogs. So no one is talking about the other animals. Like it's it's common everywhere. But when you, when you talk about animals in in public, it only covers the dogs and cats and the people who identify as um, like animal lover just love cats and dogs. <laughs> and so this is the situation in Istanbul, I guess, right now. So people are the the. Uh, although there is a leftist party uh, in the power to like uh, govern the city, the only the laws are kind of only protecting. I mean, not the laws, but the attitudes of the uh, local government is just protecting the cats and dogs of the city. Let's say, and the cats and dogs were commodified by the human beings. So, yeah, and the, the number are numbers are really high. And some people are like kind of defending the shelters, the betterment of the shelters. Some people are supporting the uh, animals who roam free in the streets. Uh, this is my attitude as well, but yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the situation is not better, but at least like I, I the story that I shared at the beginning, uh, the Boji, the story of the, of Boji, the commuter dog, it's kind of like uh, the story became viral in the time of the uh, leftist government in local government in Istanbul. So they kind of like try to relate with, uh, try to kind of represent themselves as an animal lover in this uh, government. But at the same time, as I say, the animals are just covering dogs and cats. So. Yeah. Right, yeah, it's it's an interesting situation. I'm glad to 
to have learned about it now and to continue that with your presentation here from um, from an Istanbul native as you as you describe yourself. Um, and yeah, I asked about the, the, the left wing government just because from the previous presentations um, a couple of years ago that the presenters did say other um, uh, Turkey activists in Turkey um, that the, the left, what they were calling the left wing party was at least noticeably better towards the street animals in particular. Um, so I was just wondering if they're still in power because that was at least two or three or I forget how many years ago that, that um, I, I don't remember their, their formal political position either, but that they were elected. Um, so I was wondering if that was still the case or if power had changed, so. Yeah, yeah, but at least, I mean, you're right. And uh, at least they try to kind of like um, represent themselves as the animal lover, kind of. Mm -hmm. They just like involve those kind of issues in their policies, let's say. So it was not like that before uh, this leftist party. And maybe I can share I, just a quick note for Jihan's comment. Yep. Uh, I wanna I, I would like to include those like uh, like movies that romanticize the relationship between the cats and romance. I saw the movie uh, Stray. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it kind of like captures the life of a street dog uh, in Istanbul, and it's kind of like those kind of things are really pissed me off because it's just one sided and kind of like. As you say, Jihan, just romanticize the situation without any like background story. So, and yeah, there's there was a moment in the in the movie of uh, illustrating the life of the cats, street cats in Turkey, and it, it was very popular in the U.S. I I, I remember it because the director is, although she's Turkish, she uh, she was trained in the U.S. and they, she's still living in the U.S. I guess. So, anyways, so there was a moment in the movie. Uh, there were two women kind of like boiling like tons of chickens to feed the street cats <laughs> and it was like so it was just illustrated of like loving animals let's say so it's yeah but yeah the the, the real situation is not that romantic but at least there are some people who are kind of carrying uh, those animals and kind of make differentiate what is loving animals let's say and thanks for listening and your uh, question. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thanks, Esgi. So um, I think maybe just in a little bit of interest for time, we can move to the next presentation. But if there's any other uh, questions or comments for Esgi or anyone who has presented, especially as we go on, that can please feel free to type that kind of stuff into the chat and conversations can continue there. So um, the, the next presentation. Um, is entitled Neither Tokens Nor Checkboxes, BIPOC Women in Higher Education. And so this presentation will be uh, jointly uh, presented by Angelika Rubakaba, Madeline Nash, Jenny Lai, and Jihan Mohammed. So whenever you four are ready, we can begin. Thank you, Nate. Uh, good morning, and I just want to start off by saying thank you for uh, to Nate and Sarah for reaching out and inviting us to share our piece here. Uh, my name is Angelica Rualcava. I am a doctoral student at Michigan State University, and I am here with my colleagues who will introduce themselves in a little bit. And today we're sharing pieces of an essay we wrote a couple years ago about our experiences as women of color in academia entitled Reclaiming Space, the Narratives of Female Doctoral Students of Color. And in this presentation, we aim to highlight our experiences with various forms of oppression and how they exist and are perpetuated even in spaces like institutions of higher education that claim to be spaces of equal opportunity and equity in general. We also explore how we challenge these oppressive realities within this context. So to begin, I will share a little bit about myself and my story. I am a first-generation college student. I am a Chicana and I'm the daughter of Mexican immigrants. And my story really begins with my parents. They left their home in Aguascalientes, Mexico, and made a home in California where my siblings and I were born. And then we all left California and made our way to Texas and now call Texas home. Um, so I followed their example and I made my way to Michigan to pursue my doctoral education. And although I was met with a little bit of resistance not because of the fact that I was pursuing higher education or that I was an unmarried woman leaving home, but because Mexican culture highly values family and moving so far away wasn't something that they could immediately be happy for me about. 
So I made it a point to only share my wins with my family. I was sure that if I shared anything that was less than positive, they would find a way to convince me to move back home. So I tried to prepare for what I thought my biggest hurdles would be, maybe the winters or maybe the workload, but that wasn't the case. Um, the way that I existed in this new space became my biggest barrier. And I constantly felt like an imposter, even with my BA in sociology, um, there were a lot of gaps, specifically academic jargon. I didn't even know words like jargon when I entered my program. Uh, so there was a gap and it was obvious. If not to other people, it was very obvious to me. So I worked very hard every single day not to be found out. And it really took a toll on me. And um, my experiences were very different with what a lot of discourses are surrounding imposter syndrome involved though. And it wasn't about you know, doubting my abilities or fitting in or realizing that everyone experienced imposter syndrome to a degree. I was made to feel like I didn't belong. I was told that I wouldn't be successful. I distinctly recall a conversation I walked into during my first year. Some grad students were talking about one of the only two students of color in the prospective student cohort. And they said, yeah, they're not really a good fit for the program. I'm sure if they come here, they won't make it past their first semester. And I was shocked. And I felt like I walked into a conversation I shouldn't have had access to. So my face gave me away and they quickly looked at me and said, not like that. I said the same thing about you. And I knew what they meant and it wasn't reassuring to hear those words. And that, that wasn't the only experience that gave me insights to how others perceived me. Um, as a dual major in sociology and Chicano Latino studies, a CLS for short, there was a professor in sociology who would call me the CLS student whenever they saw me around the building. And I wasn't the only student that they did it to, they did it to one other student. And it was the only other Latino grad student at the time in our department. So they often reduced us to our ethnic identity. And so these things were constant. And as soon as I began to feel comfortable and confident in my work and my place in the department, instances like those came up and they would take it away from me. I also try not to share too much with other grad students out of fear of being seen as unable to meet the rigor of the department or the program. So I suffered alone for a while and um, I didn't have the support of my family or students and um, it made my experience unbearable. So I made a million plans to leave, a different one every day. I would leave after the fall semester. I would leave after receiving my MA. I would reapply to programs I had already been accepted to. I would apply to programs I hadn't applied to. I would go back to my undergrad institution. I would go home and not pursue a PhD. I couldn't believe what, had, what I had hoped, worked and dreamt for so long had become a nightmare. However, I didn't follow through with any of those plans. I stayed. And the reality is that things didn't change overnight or even after a couple months. It wasn't until the end of my second year that I reconnected with Jenny Lai, um, my colleague and at the time a grad student in the department. And we shared our experiences with one another our hurt, our disappointment, our anger, and our drive to change the experiences in the department. So in the fall of 2019, we established the Sociology Students of Color Group, SSOC or SOCH. Uh, we recognized that marginalized students had become less engaged in the department throughout the years as a result of a variety of aggressions, racism, and other oppressive experiences. So we intentionally built SSOC to be a network for Black, Indigenous, students of color, and inter international students in our department to reclaim and build an affirming space within a department that had been less than kind to us. It has become a space where we share our stories, advice, resources, affirmation, and support. And most importantly, it is a reminder that we are not alone in our initiatives, nor in enduring any aggressions. And although the group does not eradicate the racist experiences that we have, uh, we found strength and comfort within each other. And so that being said, I'm going to pass it on to Madeline to share her piece. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madeline Nash, Indishnikaz, uh, East Lansing and Dojaba, Lansing and Da, Balatinga, Nishinabakwe, and Dao. And so, what I just said there was hello, my name is Madeline Nash. I am from East Lansing. I currently live in Lansing. And I am uh, Balating, Anishinaabekwe. That means a uh, place where the rivers meet, Anishinaabe, and I am a woman. So I am actually a member of the Sioux St. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, but I actually grew up in East Lansing my whole life. So I have a really, a slightly different, well, actually a very different experience than Angelica, um, because having grown up in this community, I'm quite aware of what it's like to live here. 
Um, you know, similarly to her though, I also have a really close kinship network. Family is a really big part of my life. And so my family was in the UP while I was growing up or my extended family. Um, but I kind of grew up in two different realities. I grew up in suburban like East Lansing in the university town. And then I'd spend like a great portion of my summers up in the UP with my extended family where my mom is one of 13. And so her brothers were native fishermen. And so we basically had this town where, you know, I had all these aunts and uncles and tons of cousins. And I grew up in a very, very different way than a lot of the children that I was friends with going to school here in East Lansing. Um, that being said too, my experiences were different in the sense that obviously I look very white. So, you know, my, Native American identity hasn't always been too much of an obstacle until I mention it. And then it's interesting, the people that you've known one way, how their stereotypes and biases can affect their interactions with you once they know that you are Native. Um, I also had a father who was white. So that kind of insulated me from a lot of experiences that Indigenous people face. So my dad actually worked at MSU as adjunct faculty in the School of Journalism for a very long time. So I grew up in East Lansing, I, I've known campus. I took summer programs at Berkey Hall where you know, the Department of Sociology is situated. So I've always felt very comfortable in these academic spaces. Um, however, that being said, I think coming to MSU um, and publicly you know, putting on my social department page that I am Native was kind of a scary process for me. Um, just because there's a lot of stereotypes, there's a lot of microaggressions uh, that I've faced since, you know, expo like basically exposing that. Um, I hear a lot of interesting things. People make assumptions that you have money from your tribe for casino pay payouts, um, you know, a lot of issues with substance abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would experience some of these, you know, stereotypes or microaggressions from other students in our department. And also sometimes I'd be surprised with what the administration and faculty would say. Um, there was one incident especially that stands out for me when, and it was not anything that was really offensive per se, but it was just showed just the general ignorance of people in the community about uh, what being Native American is. And I often relied when I was an undergrad on what's called the Michigan Indian Tuition Waiver. And that is a program that the state uh, pays for, for anybody who has sufficient quantum of Native American blood and are a member of a federally recognized tribe. If you've been a resident in Michigan at least a year prior to enrollment, the state will waive your tuition or basically the institution will waive your tuition with the idea that the state will compensate them. Um, and so I was, not, I ran out of funding and I had to talk to some administrators about getting my tuition waiver back in place. And they asked me how I got it because they think that they had a, a, you know, an aunt, a distant relative who was Indian. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, when you're Indian, you know you're Indian. Like there's no, there's no secret about that, right? I, at least for most of us. I mean, there are some people who have been taken from families, but that's a different case. Um, so it was just kind of interesting because having grown up um, Indian, and I, I do realize it is really hard to document, but there's no, you just know that you are. It, it, there's no secret, there's no um, mystery about it, but just the fact that I think I look so white, it's like this idea that, oh, anybody who's got a little bit, you can go to college for free. Um, other than that, it's definitely running into a lot of the stereotypes. Um, and especially because I feel like indigenous voices are becoming more prominent now. There's, you know, uh, activism around missing and murdered indigenous women, but also issues of land and especially going to MSU where, you know, a land grant institution. And I grew up with, you know, being very proud of that. My father, you know, always used to stress the, uh, the, basically the teaching philosophy of a land grant institution and how it was supposed to educate the common person. Um, but you know, then you find out that these land grant institutions are funded by the seizure of indigenous lands. And you know, 
MSU particularly sits on land ceded in 1819 Treaty of Saginaw and was also funded by land seizures of the 1836 Treaty of Washington. So those are, you know, that's been something that for me has been kind of hard to uh, balance in my world at MSU um, are those two things, this idea that we're a land grant, but we're also a land grab. Um, so I think in those issues sometimes also like having more of a voice, having more of a presence can almost in some instances create problems. Um, I think it was really helpful finding the, the SSOC group and talking with Angelica and Jihan and Jenny and others about our experiences because we all come from really different backgrounds, but we were having very similar interactions with oftentimes the same people. Um, and so having that support really helped me then, helped me feel better. And I, it wasn't all in my head. So that was one of the things I can say about this group was just helped basically keep me sane. And it also made me realize that I wasn't the only one and that this was a problem, right? So I was very thankful for that. Um, and we decided to co-author this paper about our experiences. Um, and you know, just the idea of writing the paper was, was difficult and were people going to see it? Were they gonna take us seriously? MSU's gotten a lot of bad press. Um, and one of the things that we, I know we did struggle with was if we were going to actually put our names on the paper. And for me, I realized, you know, I'm the only Native American in our department. And so I couldn't really hope to author a paper without people knowing who I am. Like there's no, there was no option for anonymity for me um, for that reason. You're gonna read it, you're gonna know immediately who that person is if you go and look at everyone's profiles. So that was one of the issues that we talked about and how writing this paper and how getting it published might affect us in the future. Um, so with that, um, that's all I, I'm, I, I really have to say about my portion and I'm gonna turn it over to Shihan. Um, thanks for the organizers of the conference. I am Jihan Mohammed. Um, I am Iraqi Kurdish naturalized American. And um, in my piece in these five minutes that I have, I will try to answer the following question. Why I decided to co-author this essay and actually put my name out there fearing potential consequences. Um, so I grew up in, in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan region and growing up, I, my ethnic identity was the reason why I and the Kurdish ethnic identity was, uh, was and still is uh, discriminated against. Uh, my parents are sort of survival of ethnic genocide. I am a survival of different um, conflicts. I was internally displaced at the age of six because of my ethnic identity. Um, and then uh, when I was 19, I went to Italy to get my bachelor's degree and my first master's degree. And immediately my ethnic identity disappeared. And suddenly I was this Muslim woman, uh, Jihan Muhammad. My dad's name is Abdullah. So I received a lot of racist comments. It was a brutal experience in Italy. And, uh, and this shift of identities, it was, it was just interesting. Um, then I came to the US and suddenly my ethnic identity disappeared. Uh, my religious identity somehow disappeared and suddenly I was called a woman of color, a term that I heard for the first time in my life because in the Middle East race is not relevant, ethnicity, nationalism and religion are relevant. So. I was this woman of color who is Muslim and I experienced pretty much what Angelica experienced, uh, isolation, microaggressions, um, overt racism uh, against my religion. Some of the awful comments, for example, um, I was in a statistic class and a white colleague said, I'm surprised that you are in this class. We're not used to see you in statistic classes. And another person asked me to show them how Middle Eastern, for example, use a restroom because she found that very exotic. 
um, and, and various other comments. And so I was frustrated about all these issues in the department. And like Angelica, I had no idea that other students of color and international students are going through a similar thing. And Berkey was not a space for me. I never felt belonging there. Um, and I used to share these experiences through informal channels, like chatting with Jenny or Angelica, or perhaps my advisor or family, who uh, sometimes did not understand my situation, especially family and friends. Um, so when um, SSOC was founded, I was thrilled to actually find comfort and support from um, Madeline and Helica, Jenny, and all others who decided to, to join and become members. And when we were given the opportunity to actually write this piece, despite the fear of facing some consequences, we had no idea how the department will react because basically we are talking badly about this department. However, for me, it was a, an opportunity to um, start talking about these issues publicly. Um, and oftentimes when oppressed groups face oppression and discrimination at the beginning, they, they are scared to speak up. Um, so for me, this piece was an opportunity to actually bring these issues on the table and open it up with faculty and admin. And I think we succeeded. Uh, our article and what happened in, in the summer of 2020, the silence of our department about um, the killing of uh, George Floyd opened up the floor for, for our department to finally acknowledge the um, oppressions that students of color and international students are facing in this predominantly white space. Um, we were afraid of, of, of the consequences, as I mentioned before, so I didn't want to put my name. I wanted to go anonymous. But the support that uh, SSOC gave me um, uh, encouraged me to actually put my name just bold right there and, and, and not be afraid to, to speak up. Um, so for that, I really thank the space that provided me a lot of support and was the reason I was able to finish my degree uh, despite the multiple challenges uh, and, and the not very positive experience that I had in, in the department. Um, I will leave um, the space to Jenny to kind of wrap it up. And if you have questions for me or my colleagues, please let us know. Yeah, thank you, Jihan. Um, as I'm listening to all your stories, I'm thinking, A, that's just a great demonstration, I think, of what we do in social, which is to just take the time to like reflect and to share to the extent that we're comfortable um, what's happened to us. And I'm also just actually feeling pretty emotional right now because I'm like, wow, I think we've all achieved a lot ever since the founding of SOJ. Um, so we're at this point, two PhDs completed, <laughs> uh, which was uh, very different from where we were. And we're getting real close to uh, two more PhDs completed uh, in, this, in this small group alone. So I just think that's tremendous. And, um, yeah, and I just wanted to spend a little time emphasizing that. I did not prepare um, any comments necessarily about myself and what, what I had experienced in the department, although that's articulated in the piece that we keep on referring to this, um, this opportunity that Anhalik actually found uh, that was a call for proposals or for papers about graduate student experiences. Um, and, and what it feels like sort of every day, which you can see or you can hear that, you know, um, all of my colleagues articulated very different experiences, yet at the same time really touched upon some common sources of stress and, yeah, frankly, very, very terrible and uh, terrible, terrible experiences. Um, so that's overall the, the arc of the piece and what explains why Soch um, basically became this necessity as organic as it was. Um, and so sort of on this theme, building off this theme of like um, coming together more or less organically um, and trying to uh, find a space to share stories and finding common ground, uh, sort of my, my, my closing of our presentation it actually touches upon um, Nate extending uh, this space to us. Um, and we 
uh, I, well, I should speak for myself. I, that was very unexpected. And I think we want to actually just learn more about um, what your, uh, what the impetus was for extending the space to us, knowing that in our department alone, we're characterized as very different scholars. Um, and I don't think that we have had a, a chance to really explore and kind of dig into that. So, you know, we're interested in learning about critical animal studies and their perception on the work that we do. Um, primarily, a lot of us are working from critical race studies, uh, from indigenous studies, from Latin A, uh, Latin, Latin crit, I think. Um, and I like if I didn't misrepresent. Um, and in Jihan's work in an international realm, uh, looking at all sorts of disparities uh, and, and myself as well. Um, so I guess I would also just, as uncomfortable as it is, I, I will take on this admittance of, um, I perceive uh, that sometimes animal studies spaces and participants come from our, I guess, it is a very white dominant space. And certainly this was the case at Michigan State when I first joined. I, I remember actually attending a couple of um, animal studies meetings and kind of having these awkward encounters where people would be telling me like, I don't really care about humans. I just care about animals, <laughs> which was a little bit shocking um, just coming from where I was coming from uh, as a novice sociologist. And so rather than kind of just sort of like turn away from that, I think I just wanted to spend the last, last couple of minutes like actually digging into that sort of um, maybe uh, those perceptions of these different fields. And rather I'd be interested in hearing from the participants and from the organizers, what you see as common ground. Is it shared ethical values? Is it um, sort of, uh, let's see, what else do I have in my notes? Um, uh, are, you know, are there different types of activism that we tend to engage in, um, but we just haven't talked about? Um, I, I think that for me, I also at the same time really attribute to animal studies very sophisticated theories and ideas uh, about you know, a broader social world and who's included, those questions of who's included uh, and who, um, who, who uh, per, I guess is, has a role in an impactful within social phenomena that we're interested in, um, in questions about uh, you know, who, who's defined and who's included uh, when we study inequalities. All those things are in, I attribute animal studies to being an incredible theorizing force in, with those questions. Um, and I'm just not as familiar with how those questions are applied to say, like looking at like racial injustice in the United States, for example. So wanting to learn more about that, I'm rambling at this point. So um, I've definitely lost, uh, lost a little bit of the gotten off script. So I guess um, I will just end with, uh, I think we're really enthusiastic about learning from the scholars and participants here at this conference about, you know, what do we, what do we have in common and how are we using those commonalities in our respective fields and um, what uh, motivations for the work that we do, do we share, but we haven't yet just talked about explicitly because that's what, again, as my colleagues noted, the space for SOCH and maybe for this space, that's that's what it is, uh, that's what it's for. Um, and then also just what questions you have for us. Uh, I think we're very, uh, we very much welcome discussion. So thank you very much for having us. All right, so thanks um, all four of you, Jenny, Annelika, Jihan, and Madeline. Uh, oh, great, yeah, so someone, I just because of my screens, I can't see who posted this yet, but at least there's the citation for it. Yeah, Annelika, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to ask you all too, it, if there was a way to actually share the paper, I don't know if you can because of copyright issues, but the citation is at least good, that's something. Um, but if, if you wanted to, um, yeah, I think it'd be really cool to share that. Um, with others and help uh, promote that, circulate it. Um, so, yeah, uh, so thank you for uh, this. I'm, I'm really glad. I don't want to speak a lot personally because this conference is meant to highlight the voices of the presenters. I'm not a presenter. Um, this is meant to give space to others. Um, but I am glad you all, really glad you all um, like weren't scared off by the animal and critical animal studies. I, I tried to make that clear in some drafts of my emails that might have gotten somehow deleted, but um, 
Yeah, so so I really wanted to to uh, to bring you on for exactly well why you're here, just to share your own voices, your own experiences. It's also obviously very applicable to students, and this is a student conference, um, uh, so it's just it's just wonderful, and we love voices that speak from experience, um, which we've had so far. Um, and so to bring to bring people together like this too, this joint presentation of working together from different backgrounds, common experiences, yet still different, they're still unique. It's just great. It's really great all around. And I love it. I love the article. Um, ever since I read it, I was very fascinated by it. I couldn't get it out of my head for at least 24 hours, um, even if I like, tried to work on other things. So um, it's just great. But I want to stop and, and see if so Jenny asked about the other colleagues and such. So if, if others have um, comments to, to Jenny's, um, you know, our question there, uh, putting out about the community, please, I would like others to speak. Yeah. You know, I wanted to speak to the, the question. I know um, it looks like Jihan also did as well in the chat. Um, there actually is an Indigenous graduate um, student collective here at MSU, and I participated in it, but it can be difficult because um, I'm social science. I actually really love quantitative work, and a lot of times Indigenous methodologies can be sometimes a little bit too dismissive of quantitative work. So I found that um, what I tend to gravitate towards was not appreciated per se in that particular um, space. So I, I think it was really helpful having a group in our department who understood our discipline um, to lend support to me. Um, and I would say like IGSC has actually gotten better about um, having people who, who like to do like for instance statistics and whatnot. And that's because there's been, you know, more articles published on that and there's, you know, growing indigenous involvement in gathering statistics. But I definitely think having the support within the department has been crucial. Uh, so if I may just jump in to clarify uh, um, something else that, that Jenny posted. Um, was was uh, something I think that that Madeline was getting at there too, and asking why uh, from the, these presenters why trying to find community within the Chicano Latino Studies program or the Indigenous Student Group or the Muslim Studies program all at MSU, um, why those weren't adequate for surviving in their um, department specifically. So there's that. If if either or any of you would like to to respond to. I think I'll add a little bit, but I also wanted to share our contact information. I have a slide. Um, um, yeah, I think that's a really important question, Jenny. I think um, I've spoken a little bit to Madeline about it, and there's just very complicated experience even within those spaces that, you know, maybe often are just labeled like safe spaces or, you know, spaces where you should feel supported and valued and, you know, all these other beautiful things. But in the reality, you know, they're a lot more complicated than that. So I think um, our focus on SSOC and building a space in sociology was very intentional because uh, this is also our space and, you know, we shouldn't have to go to other spaces to feel supported and um, feel that we belong. So um, like Madeline said, you know, we're, we're social scientists, we're sociologists. Uh, we need to make space for ourselves and our work in, in these spaces that we exist. Um, and yeah, it's just, um, yeah, like I said, just complicated, complicated experiences in every space. But um, I think our intentionality was uh, to make it specifically in sociology, um, because uh, most of us, uh, I'm a dual, but even then, like most of us, our homes are in sociology. So making our academic homes um, what they need to be for us was very important for us. Or at least for me, you know. <laughs> Actually, I'll just add to that because I can offer even like a post-grad perspective. So um, if you notice that uh, my title right now is called the Andrew Harris Fellow and Andrew Harris Fellow at the University of Vermont. 
uh, or Andrew, Andrew Harris at the University of Vermont actually refers to the first black student at University of Vermont. So they've conceived of this fellowship that they offer uh, limited spots to not every year either um, to different uh, to different uh, recent grads um, from different disciplines to come to uh, the University of Vermont and sort of start transitioning into these tenure track positions. Um, so I'm in a fellowship cohort of four people um, and yet I'm the only social scientist. So even though like they are other scholars of color and they um, are doing really good work and you know groundbreaking work in their respective fields, um, my cohort members are from like theater and arts, um, art history. And so for me, um, even though like ostensibly we're, we're, we're seen as this, again, this cohort that, uh, that can sort of be tethered together because of our work, respective work in racial justice, um, I've actually really struggled to connect to them <laughs> because um, just the way they are, like their quote unquote, like research products, their scholarly products are so different. Like they're directing plays or they have to put on a show. Whereas like I have, I publish papers, right? So the questions that I ask and as well as how I answer those questions sort of empirically is just so different. And it's, it, it's a different form. It's a different pacing. Um, even the way in which we, uh, the attitudes we have towards like our uh, research funds are so different. Like like some some people are scheduling trips to Paris, you know, and, and I'm like, I have to hoard all of that because I don't know what I need. I don't know if I need software. I don't know if I need textbooks. I don't know if I need research. So, you know, it's just even those like disciplinary um, thing, uh, differences are they become even more distinct and it feels like um, important and, and a little hard to traverse um, even after you graduate um, and you're kind of lumped together in this like, you know, again, like scholars of color, faculty and staff of color group, like there's still a lot of difference. And, and that's not to say that you can't find community there, but it's really important for me to um, find sociologists, to find social scientists who like, who are doing, as Madeline was saying, what we love, which is asking the questions we're asking and then using the data that we love um, and, and that is fulfilling, right? And that's what we deserve too. So, um, and I also just wanted to I, uh, note that uh, I saw Mark, Mark Suhita's answer to um, those open-ended questions I posed at the end um, and just really wanna thank him for the answer, um, which can be summed up as uh, total liberation, I guess, of, of every, everyone. So thanks, Mark. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, is there anything else along the line of the, oh, this last, uh, Jihan, your hands raised? Um, yeah, I just want to comment on the Muslim Studies program. I guess my experience was different um, than Angelica and Madeline. I actually found a lot of support in that space, uh, especially academic support. I may not have socialized enough with graduate students affiliated with the Muslim Studies program. However, um, that space gave me um, a lot of encouragement to keep doing what I was doing because in the sociology department, I was literally told that if I keep doing this type of research on, uh, on, on the Middle East, I will never get funding or a scholarship. And as a second year graduate student, I believe that statement that came from um, um, a a faculty who is a senior faculty. So I was terrified if what I was doing was actually relevant. So Muslim studies program actually opened the space for me to connect with other scholars, with other graduate students, with journals, uh, conferences, and sometimes even funding and awards. So I do thank Muslim studies program and I encourage um, every graduate student who, feels isolated or facing certain types of problems to find a community where they can uh, feel, um, I guess, uh, supported and, and welcome because otherwise it's to fight, to fight this journey alone, it's, it's not easy. Okay. Great, yeah, so thanks all, um, or you all. 
Is there anything else for this um, this presentation before we move on? Maybe I can just thank you all again as an as an international student in the department. So the article is on my desktop since it was out, and I just like seeing it, giving the support. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for the article and sharing your stories and creating this inclusive space in the department. Yeah, that's all. All right, well, thanks. All right, so, um, yeah. So I think from one interesting presentation to another, um, I think all the ones we got today are, are like going to be amazing. I haven't seen them yet, but of course I know about them or seen all of them yet. Um, but yeah, one of the things we try to do within critical animal studies is give space for marginalized voices. So if you if people have issues elsewhere, we can be a place um, of either speaking, uh, publishing, or being otherwise involved, networking, and so uh, so on. Um, so uh, or or also just giving people an opportunity to do things where maybe other just in general other uh, spaces or other institutions are for whatever reason presenting that so this is also a, a place to step away from traditional uh, sorts of formats um, and styles as well and so the next or the the next but also i think the rest of our presentations also contain some of those non-traditional elements um, which i think is going to be really exciting so the next presentation is titled animal noises exploring the value of noise positive research methodologies for animal studies and this will be co-presented by sarah warren and sammy hopkins so when you're ready go ahead Uh, I'm Sammy, this is Sammy speaking. Um, just for a quick description, I'm, I'm black mixed race. I have curly dark hair, I'm wearing an oversized black sweater and I'm against a mostly white background. Next to me is my colleague, Nick and Sarah. Yes, um, I'm Sarah, um, I'm white. I have uh, brown hair and I'm wearing a pink and dark green hair, flower hair clip um, and a gray dress that's sitting beside you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, calling in from Berlin. Um, okay, so I'm just going to take, a, take a, a start here with our abstract for those who have not yet uh, had a chance to read through it. Also, if you could just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right, that would be really fantastic. Good? Okay. Um, so in previous research in disability uh, studies and sound geography, we have defined a methodology of harsh noise-based research, which explores connection between harsh noise art and knowledge production concerning disability and space. Uh, in this presentation, an online harsh noise performance, we inquire with harsh noise into two themes, uh, DIY <coughs> punk anarchist social movements and representations and perceptions of non-human animal sounds. Regarding DIY punk anarchist movements, we argue that activist cultures can be enriched by harsh noise because it is an accessible art form conducive to easy and flexible non-hierarchical collaboration. Regarding animals, we argue that harsh noise art and research can critique uh, the ways that animal sounds are sometimes perceived by humans as unintelligible, overwhelming, unpleasant, or distorted forms of human communication, in short, as harsh noise. Opposing prevailing species <coughs> logic, we develop the concept of noise positivity to characterize research methodologies that involve a normative and aesthetic valuing of noises emitted by non-human animals. In contrast to the dismissal, reje rejection, and denigration they sometimes receive. Through noise positive, harsh noise based research, utilizing harsh noise to process animal liberation activist interviewees and other collaborators' responses to thematic prompts, we invite listeners and readers to reflect on these research sub questions. What makes non human animal sounds and noises intelligible or unintelligible? How is this distinction drawn and by whom? How ought liberatory social movements responsibly engage with and represent sounds, including noises of non-human animals? <clears throat> and how may animal noises be productively and respectfully integrated into the data gathering, analysis, and dissemination of animal studies research? Um, so we spoke with interviewees uh, using a number of prompts to get them started. Uh, they responded with both field recordings and audio recordings of their voices in response to these prompts, some of which included how do you understand non-human animals? How do you comprehend and receive the messages non-human animals communicate? 
How do your understandings of animals' communications inform your radical politics? <coughs> what do the sounds animals make mean to you? What's the difference between animal communication and animal noise? Do animal noises need translating? If so, how would one do it? Can animal noises be involved in research and how? And what might it mean to listen respectfully to animal noises? So next we're gonna move into a, a sound experiencing session, again, which is a combination of field recordings and uh, some of these audio interviews. Um, you may also notice that we've applied the noise effects rather gradually throughout the performance, shifting the speech of human animals via the interview uh, contributions into what we might perceive as, as noise. And then that we're also questioning where in the soundscape session, uh, that line between intelligibility and unintelligibility, unintelligibility is, is crossed. Um, this is a work in progress. Uh, it's, a, it's a creative sample of some of the things we've assembled so far to demonstrate the concept that we're, we're working with. Um, and we'll be gathering more sound data in the near future to add here as well. So during this time, we also invite you to uh, reflect on the research questions that we, we just mentioned uh, as we experience the soundscape. Um, please feel free to turn your cameras off if you would like and adjust the volume on your devices as feels comfortable. Um, and the session's going to be approximately 15, 15 minutes in length, after which time we can do a little Q&A discussion. <coughs> We'd love to hear your feedback. All right. Uh, we're going to try to share the screen uh, in, just in order to play this music. So if somebody could just react if you can hear or, or tell me if you mm -hmm. can't hear, we're going to try to press play now. Um, or just in a minute, actually. Or, okay. That doesn't seem to be coming through, I don't think. I'm not hearing it. OK, that's good to know. Thank you. I'll just take a minute to try to make it work then. Um, yeah. Still, still nothing now, right? I hear that. I heard that, yeah. Oh, you hear that? OK, OK, good. I think it'll For work now. Bit. So OK, I think it um, so I'll just, yeah, and then I stopped it. OK, so I'm going to start again from the beginning. Okay. Uh, in a couple seconds. Hopefully it'll work now. Thank you. Oh, 
it's just like so happy, you know. I would, I'm not sure like if I would understand it.
Okay, that's that's the end of that uh, the the noise. So I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen now. And we're back. Uh, so yeah, if there's time, uh, happy to take any questions or uh, any sort of comments or discussion. And uh, just to just to clarify what that was, it was a it was a recording of a live improvised performance. But of course, the performance wasn't happening right now, obviously. But it was all. It was done within the, that same time span, the 15 minutes, and then recorded uh, at the same time to be able to share with you now. So thanks for listening. All right, um, very cool. Thank you, Sarah and Sammy. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed listening to that. First of all, it's just so different, and I love the sort of jarring aspect of just something that's different. When it, when it hits you, um, it's just kind of a refresher, you know, of not seeing or listening, being or experiencing the same thing over and over. So I really appreciate those experiences completely of themselves. Um, so that was that was really interesting, and and it certainly adds to it the little bit at the end that you just um, said about that being improvised and live in the moment, whenever that moment was, at least, um, and that's just how things came together. So, yeah, that's really awesome. Um, Oh gosh, yeah. So Thank you. we we have uh, this comment here uh, from Emily that, that was very interesting and fascinating to feel how uh, Emily's body and brain responded to the different elements of the noise. So yeah, it's a very sort of visceral experience, a physical experience. I don't know if you wanted to comment on any, on that at all or respond, but you can. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we were uh, we were definitely interested in. Um the possibility that this could have an effect on people, not only through uh, hearing maybe just in the ears, but also like feeling, uh, maybe feeling the vibrations, perhaps especially when it's really loud and, uh, or if it's affecting the body, not just because it's loud, but in other ways. But in any case, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting to us the way that uh, the harsh noise can, can affect one's body in a visceral way. And that's like, yeah, part of the, the appeal. Mm -hmm and the joy of this of this art form yeah mm -hmm. so that's really nice feedback thank you yeah, yeah. and also um i don't know if you already mentioned this but uh we are like we're interested in sort of uh more people kind of being interviewed if if they want like for their voices to sort of be used in something like this so if anybody wants to do that uh you can feel free to uh contact us about that yeah it would it would be fun Oh, okay. Yeah, very yeah, good. You turn it down, uh, which, which is totally valid uh, mm -hmm. and healthy. To, yeah, I appreciate that you did that. Uh, you wrote it was making me nauseous as I'm quite sensitive to sound. Yeah. So. Uh, and yeah, I was actually just living in an apartment recently that was too loud for me. And uh, so that, and it was making me really unwell. So that was definitely like an instance of uh, unwanted noise. Mm -hmm. So there's a real spectrum of, yeah, whether noise is it's not necessarily always positive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even though we're interested in exploring the concept of noise positivity in our, in our research, yeah. Yeah, I had a, oh wait, I didn't raise my hand. Can I say something? Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, this was making me think about, I had, um, I lived in an apartment where there was a dog that they left out all the time um, and it would constantly bark. And I really, really struggled with that in like a lot of ways because I wanted to like be okay with like sharing space with another, with the animal, right? But then I found the sound to be like, you know, hard to sleep, hard to think, hard to, you know. So anyway, this was just making me think of that seems like in y'all, in your realm, right? To think through these different things and how it overlaps. So thank you for opening us up to thinking about those questions. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, totally. I actually also I was not even the same apartment, but the previous apartment I was there was also a dog who was uh, barking and crying a lot. Um, pro probably just because uh, the dog was quite lonely would be my guess. Um, trying to perhaps understand and empathize with the sounds that you know, but like, like in our project, not completely sure, maybe what it means. Um, and it was also really distressing for me too. So yeah, that's, that's another example of the, the yeah, the distressing aspect of, of noises or sounds that can come come from an animal nearby. 
which yeah, also for, for me at least listening back to this product, I mean, the later parts of it, right, that are more uh, intense and grating there. Yeah, they were kind of reminding me of that too, like uh, that it can, it can be stressful and um, uh, sort of tug at my heart to hear maybe another being in pain and the sounds that they use to express that. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, are there any other uh, questions for this presentation? All right, well, um, maybe in that case we can uh, move on, but as always, comments uh, or questions, if they come up, can continue to be put um, in the chat. So, um, so the, uh, the next presentation um, is also going to feature uh, Sarah again. And this, this title is, or sorry, this presentation is titled Excerpts from Antid Antediluvian, Surly Pilot, Relentless Swordsman, and Contemptor Divum. So mm. Sarah, when you are ready. Okay, thank you. I just need to uh, just take a minute actually. Um, yep, so sure. just bear with me. Okay, okay, we're, we're back. Uh, so, um, yes, so I, this was, this presentation, this was supposed to be done uh, by me and uh, Leon, my collaborator with this, um, but he unfortunately can't make it today. Um, but but I'll, I'll present the way both of us would have uh, more or less wanted to. So uh, yeah, in this presentation, um, I'm just gonna be um, uh, sharing uh, three, um, uh, songs or lyric poems. It's not harsh noise, it's more the songs. Um, and they're called Surly Pilot, Relentless Swordsman, and Contemptor Dewum. And these these songs, they're part of a larger world building project, um, which involves music and ambient field recordings. And that project was is called Antediluvian, which means before uh, the flood. So in, in, in Antediluvian, there's a story there's several um, non-human animal characters who rebel against um, a uh, colonizing group of, of humans. Um, and, and there's uh, themes around um, oppression and exploitation and pollution of, of animals and the nearby environment causing a flood. Um, and throughout the, this project, we with the lyrics, we've um, explored um, myth and we've been uh, sort of exploring with this with a somewhat unreliable narrator of uh of from these uh the speciesist kind of distorted perspective of the of the human characters in the story like this myth that they are uh telling about this past time uh where there was this conflict uh with with these um characters so um so that that's to contextualize these lyrics um so from from the perspective of uh, these these human characters in this in this story, um, they are they're describing um, some different animals. Uh, like uh, one one character is is nicknamed a surly pilot as a sort of like uh, insult, and that's toward like a, a bird uh, that they don't like, uh, for example. Um, yeah, and uh, one other yeah just fact interesting about this project um, just to explore sort of our. Uh, ambivalence about uh, technology and music and the use of, um, of uh, computers and whatnot to mediate um, music between the creator of it and the audience. Uh, we decided to kind of exaggerate those problems by for ourselves by only using a microphone from the video game rock band to record all of the audio. Um, and uh, we um, isolated ourselves in a, in a boiler room in a basement for about six weeks most of the time uh, doing that. So to kind of put ourselves in a negative space. So yeah, with that said, um, I invite you to uh, sit back uh, and enjoy this if you, if you want, um, even though it's dark. 
um, but it, yeah, it's, it's an expression of, of uh, our, our interest in values anyway, I think. And so now I just have to open up uh, this Bandcape, Bandcamp page where this stuff is and then share the screen again and uh, press play on some things. And the uh, lyrics uh, will be visible on the screen share as well to follow along with. So, okay, here we go. Computer is just um, frozen, hopefully temporarily. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so this is uh, Surly Pilot. Uh, it's just still loading, I guess, but it should play soon. It doesn't matter to refresh the page. Sorry about the delay. Here we go.
Okay, so yeah, that was uh, Surly Pilot. Um, just realized probably to should have also mentioned one other thing, just that this uh, this the story of this album it places events in a in a speculative, different um, alternative like future, in which um, there's a post-industrial society of some humans who never invented flight. So that's why there's these uh, back and forths about um, planes and stuff, and they're envying this bird. Um, but okay, so to continue on now, uh, just a couple of much shorter songs and then it's over. Um, so the next one uh, is called um, Relentless Swordsman. So we're skipping ahead a bit in the story, which we already started midway through anyway. Um, it's very simple, this song. It's just um, portraying basically more of this sort of um, speciesist ideology that justifies violence um, to um, uh, in this case, uh, nominate a uh, champion to fight on behalf of this colonizing uh, group of, of human characters against this um, rebellion that's been taking place, uh, led by uh, these um, non-human animal characters. So here's this song, and uh, you see in the lyric sheet, it's, it's spoken from the perspective of these gods, which of course, with the unreliable narration, it's the gods from the perspective of the myths of the colonizing humans uh, who are narrating this, this myth. So here we go, this is Relentless Swordsman. Might just take a moment to get started again.
uh, yeah, that was Relentless Swordsman. And lastly, uh, just going to play just the start a little bit of Contemptor Dewim, uh, not the whole song, because as you can see, it's quite long. Um, and that'll be that. So further explorations and sort of violent um, speciesist uh, myths of the these colonizing human characters, I guess, um, kind of in the tradition of, of other bands who uh yeah explore speciesism and connect that with like heavy metal uh to kind of bring out the horror of it um so here we go this is can, this just the start of contempt of demon stop it there. Uh, thanks a lot for listening and um, thank you for providing a space that uh, takes um, artistic knowledge production methods seriously in an academic context. Um, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and if there's any questions or, or comments for discussion, happy to hear them. Um, thanks again.
All right. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah, uh, for that presentation as well. So yeah, um, I'm really happy that uh, you. Um, so I don't know on behalf of or with Leon for this presentation, and then um, with with Sammy for the other one, um, submitted these because they are just they're very different. They're even different for for critical animal studies, which strives to be different and to um, promote. Uh, alternative forms of uh, expression. So um, I think it's it's pretty much a first around this sort of space, but I'm I'm very glad it is. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, thank thank you very much, Nathan. Oh yes. Um, so yeah, are there other are there um, uh, questions again for this this presentation or or comments? Sometimes maybe we can express ourselves better in terms of comments. Um, uh, in terms of what we experienced, felt, so on. Yeah, we'd be open to those as well. If people just want to share what it meant to them or what it felt like, but it's also cool if not. <laughs> Thanks for listening as well. I have a couple of questions. Uh, First of all, thank you. It's really fascinating for me. It's really something new and it was pleasure to hear. So yeah, it was, it was an experience for me and I really enjoyed it. So I wonder if there's any like virtual space for the records that we can listen afterwards. Cause I, I, I suspect that I missed some points, some elements of it, especially the first recording that you shared with us with the animal uh, voices with the animal and the non-human. Uh, Humans and non-human animals. So, yeah, is there any space? Yes. If there's any space, I would appreciate that. Absolutely, yeah. I'll just paste in the chat there. Uh, we just archived all of the recordings available for free on Bandcamp, um, and you, yeah, you can stream them there or um, download them even uh, for free. It just says name your price, but you can just name zero uh, if you want, and that's <laughs> no no offense. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Mm -hmm available there and the lyrics and the sort of conceptual description as well yeah thank you thank you a lot for your interest and i have another question so maybe i missed that part it was about the first sampling uh, you and sami the, the sample that you presented together so maybe i missed that part maybe you already presented but how did you select which human or non-human animals voices that you i mean what was your did you purposefully sample this group of individuals or I'm asking, I know some traditional questions, like I still have this like traditional perspective, research perspective, but yeah, that's why I asked. I wonder so how you pick this, select this group of individuals. It's a good question. Um, Sammy, do you want to take that or do you want me to take it? Okay, me. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, Sammy's still here. Uh, um, so we, uh, Firstly, with the people we talked to, um, we uh, we talked to people who are already invested in and involved in um, like animal liberation uh, activism and I ideals and stuff. Um, so we were we were curious for their kind of perspectives on the role the role of, and the meaning of animal sounds, animal noises in their life and in their uh, politics. And then um, with the with the the recordings, uh, the, the sort of field recordings, we could call them, um, of uh, like uh, birds and, and chickens and cows and cats um, and, I'm for, and, and rabbits. Um, those were actually also supplied by those people. So we, we actually, um, oh no, we also supplied some ourselves, but most of them were supplied by the people we talked to. And then we sort of, we did that on purpose to try to see if maybe if there's like connections between, you know, what they, what the people are saying and what they're thinking and then like the noises they're collecting for us. And we specifically prompted the people, like uh, we, we encouraged them to give us sounds from animals that, uh, you know, they really, um, they think have some relevance to the sort of questions we're asking with the, with the project. Um, yeah, so that, that was kind of our methodology, uh, you could say, uh, with how to select, um, but yeah, with, with something like this, this arts-based kind of research, I guess um, we don't feel we have to worry too much about like getting a super generalizable or statistically um, you know, controlled or whatever kind of sample. So uh, we just did the kind of more uh, qualitative uh, snowballing kind of standard way of, of doing it instead. So yeah, 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. Yeah. Um, so there's not at the moment. Yeah, providing the link. I was I was going to ask for that too. So I'm I'm glad Eski ended up um, kind of bringing that out, and you could share that with us, Sarah. Because uh, yeah, I think it could be nice to also just um, revisit on our own time as well, right? When when uh, when moods are right, I think that's really important for that kind of thing. Um, but so also like this kind of this kind of stuff, the recordings you shared with us. It seems to me like this would be really great to listen to, particularly uh, with your eyes closed and then really just kind of, you know, let let the sounds take you where they take you. So possibly even in the dark to help with that. I don't know, you know, it depends on the person. But that's really what I think about is, is um, what you're sharing really, I think, sort of requires uh, really like alone time when you can just focus on the sounds. Yeah. And and see what see what they do. Um, so yeah, so having that to share is great. That can that can be visited then by others and shared by others as well. So that sounds great. I think it's very flattering too. If anyone paid it that close attention. So yeah, thank you for the for thinking of it that way. Yeah. All right. Oh uh, yeah. That that's how I've kind of come to view music like um, like that. Is I think it demands the attention. Um, so not like not like now i'm not saying now it's some sort of inappropriate way to listen to it i mean i'm glad you shared it but um what i would want to do personally is revisit it in that sort of way like i said and really dedicate time to it as well as thought after because at the you know, at this point we have um to more or less move on as well so uh, i i don't feel i can do it the proper justice but um yeah so that was just what i was feeling about it. well thank you for that yeah Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, all right, so let's move on to our last presentation today. And so this is by Abby Nelson. And Abby's presentation is titled The Potential Body Mind Spirit Benefits of Holistic Interventions for Intimate Partner Violence Survivors. So go ahead, Abby, when you are ready. I, let's see, is it, show, it's not showing me what I'm sharing. Can you see my screen? Yeah, the uh, PowerPoint screen, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so I am not a poet. <laughs> I mean, I guess I shouldn't say I'm not a poet, but like, that's not what I claim to do, but I really wanted to push myself with this presentation when I saw the call for this conference and saw that you could do some more non-traditional ways of presenting, I really wanted to kind of do a mix of an empirical literature review of the potential body, mind, spirit uh, benefits of holistic interventions for intimate partner violence survivors. But I also am going to mix in there um, a like spoken word slash group meditation in this. So we'll see how all this comes together. Um, I'm just trying to use a little bit of my creative juices, but I'm a doctoral candidate in the School of Social Work at Michigan State University, and I'm also a therapist, and my specialization is intimate partner violence and sexual assault. And specifically, since I've come back to get my PhD, I've been focusing on holistic interventions, and I will go over what that is. So um, I don't know, you know, what area of focus everyone is in, but intimate partner violence, I'm sure you've heard of it. IPV is a global health issue that affects all cultures and genders. And I want to say right here that, you know, um, I, my particular research focuses on um, female, uh, female identified uh, persons, but we do know that not only females are victims and survivors of intimate partner violence, that's just not and we, uh, my particular focus here, but I did want to acknowledge that and not, not leave that out. But um, intimate partner violence is defined by the World Health Organization as any behavior within an intimate relationship that causes phys physical, 
psychological or sexual harm to those that are involved in the relationship. So sometimes it's under the umbrella of domestic violence, but this we're talking about in intimate partners. 30% of women over the age of 15 have experienced IPV um, or non-partner sexual violence or both in their life. And a fourth of all women in the US have reported being survivors of some type of IPV. So we see that this is a huge global problem and it affects individuals, communities, and society. The most recent um, economic figure that I found was over the life of one survivor, it can be up to $3.8 billion um, that is used in community resources with medical expenses, court costs, and all of this. So we're thinking about it mostly in this presentation, how it's affecting individual survivors, but I also wanted to acknowledge from the start that it has a global impact on communities and society as well. So thinking about what happens to the body, the mind, and the spirit because of this, so we know that there is a connection between survivors having a higher risk for high cholesterol, heart disease, stroke, joint disease, asthma, HIV risk factors, and other activity limitations, especially when they're in active situations of violence. Mentally, there is a higher risk of depression, substance abuse, chronic mental illness, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety. These come from systematic reviews and meta-analysis that are comparing um, survivors of IPV to those that are not. And so we see a, um, a stronger connection with these mental health effects. And then spiritually, a lot of the spiritual consequences um, have been harder to quantify, but have been taken a lot from qualitative studies. So um, Center and Caldwell did a phenomenological study um, talking to survivors and found that they felt disconnected from themselves and others and had an inability to use emotional resources to connect with spirituality while in an abusive relationship. And then another qualitative study found that they that survivors felt a lack of reason for living, had um, insufficient sense of purpose, lower feelings of productivity and self-comfort. So we see how all that could connect um, to one's spiritual self. So giving all of that back at that background, when we think about interventions that are used for survivors, a lot of the ones that are researched um, most heavily come from the traditional cognitive behavioral therapy realms. And the problem with that is that it focuses mainly on the mind and how do we uh, work with survivors from entering through the mind to help them overcome this. And there have been results shown, but what my research is really looking at is that now that we have a lot of research that shows that trauma affects the body and the brain and this mind-body connection, we, um, we're now seeing the need for interventions that really take a more holistic approach to help rewire the brain and uh, release the trauma that's held in the body. Um, um, some of you might have read the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Vanderkolk. He's kind of the leading researcher with this mind-body connection when it comes to trauma healing. And so from that, you know, just trying to understand what do we know? Are we using holistic interventions with survivors or not? And also it's, it's important to note that again, from qualitative studies, survivors had a, have identified that the healing process that they go through is multidimensional. So if survivors themselves are saying, you know, in order for me to heal from this traumatic thing that I've been through, um, it's more than just one level of healing, then how can we as therapists and as community members that are trying to support these, these women in healing, support them on multiple levels? So the definition of a holistic intervention is an intervention that acknowledges the multidimensionality of the individual and the environment in which they live and seeks to support the individual on one or more of the levels of body, mind, spirit healing. So it, it was first used, uh, the term um, holism um, was first used in uh, the 20th century by South African naturalist Jan Smuts, talking about how things in biology are all connected with one another. And then it has been built on by a lot of ancient traditions um, from Eastern medicine, from Ayurvedic and East Asian perspectives really, really have 
dove a lot deeper than from our biomedical uh, mindset that often does not view the individual um, from not only their holistic perspective within themselves, but how they interact with the environment. So using holism theory, as well as the integrated body, mind, spirit um, framework from Lee et al., they propose that interventions need to take into account the dynamic balance of the interrelationship among the mind, the body, and the spirit as fundamental to health, mental health, and well-being of individuals. So in the field of social work, Lee et al. all are, were the first ones out of the, they had a partnership with the University of Hong Kong and Ohio State University to look at um, what body, mind, spirit interventions have been used with for mental health conditions. And these, they were looking at things like mindfulness and meditation, yoga, qigong, dance, relaxation, massage, acupuncture, and tai chi. And they found that 83.1% of these 199 RCTs that were looked at, the participants reported positive effects, 16.9 had no effects, and none of them were negatively effective which again gives us some preliminary evidence to think potentially this could be helpful for not just mental health conditions, but other things that, that people are going through. So then what I did for my comprehensive exam is I did a, uh, uh, empirical literature review to look at the state of knowledge that we have right now on the holistic interventions for IP survivors. And the, the results were broken into six categories of interventions. Those that were body-based, which included things such as yoga, psychological protocolized, protocolized programs. So there were like holistic um, curriculum that was done with several groups of survivors that fit under that category, nature-based, and this included things such as horticultural therapy, which was super interesting, artistic expression, which included dance, drama, music, mindfulness and meditation, and then spiritually focused interventions. And of course, all of these, because they are body, mind, spirit interventions, they might, for example, the body-based ones might originally seem from the outside to focus more on the body at the forefront. So for example, in yoga, you're moving your body, but it's also having effect on the mind and the spirit as well. So I used um, multiple databases and I started with 2,164 and using my uh, criteria, I those were brought down to 40 because I was only looking at qualitative, quantitative and mixed mess methods. Um, studies that had a holistic intervention and the sample had to be uh, female IPV survivors or trauma survivors that clearly indicated some percentage of them were survivors of IPV. So what that got down to, and um, I'm just checking my time here. I'm just making sure I'm not talking too, too quickly because I want to make sure I get to the other section of this. But these were the things that came out of it for bodily healing outcomes. Survivors reported improved sleep. Those that participated in Qigong and music therapy, there were improved physical symptoms um, and physiological changes for, for those that, that took, took part in mindfulness awareness and body-oriented therapy. Now, of course, because this is a short presentation, I'm not going into like all the methodology of these different interventions, um, but the mental healing outcomes had the strongest empirical evidence. So there were actually effect sizes for the intervention effects on some of these. For example, the TCTSY, which is, which is a, a trauma-sensitive yoga protocolized program, had effect sizes just as large as those that you find in clinical trials for antidepressants. So that was really strong evidence to support that. Um, there was also decrease in depression, PTSD, and anxiety through meditation and yoga, and improved self-esteem um, correlated with stress management programs and forgiveness therapy. And then the spiritual healing outcomes were mostly found through qualitative and mixed method studies, but forgiveness therapy and drama therapy led to survivors reporting, feeling an increase in meaning and purpose, and then those that took place in holistic healing arts retreats and holistic cognitive therapy groups found that they had an increased hope for their future. 
So some of the limitations of this body of literature is that most of them had small sample sizes. Over half had between 10 and 40 participants. So there wasn't a, a there weren't huge groups that were participating this in this. And most used convenience proposed uh, proposive sampling. Also, they were predominantly working with white educated females. Um, but one uh, thing that was super interesting is that over 15 countries were represented with these holistic interventions. So that's super interesting. And it also points to the um, that this is not just happening in the US. In fact, when, my, when I did my first search, uh, my, my committee actually rejected my proposal because I hadn't found enough studies in the US. So I actually had a harder time finding holistic interventions that were being used with survivors in the United States, which is, which is interesting to think about and has implications for us moving forward. And of course, a lot of these studies were descriptive and exploratory, so we cannot make um, causal connections here, but we do know that um, something is happening and their survivors are benefiting from these um, interventions. So the where I am linking this to the total, total liberation theory and kind of bringing this back around to critical animal studies is thinking about um, veganism and particularly ethical veganism and how when all of these body, mind, spirit interventions were talking about what was going on in the body and the mind of the spirit, but none of them were thinking about what were the people or their survivors actually putting into their bodies that potentially could be affecting their healing. So this is where I'm proposing an expansion um, moving forward. And, um, and just a quick definition of veganism is a philosophy and way of living which seeks to exclude as far as possible and practical all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals. So there is a body of research showing that there, um, there can be improved mental health and includes improved improved mental, physical, and spiritual health for those that have a plant-based diet, but particularly for IPV survivors, there's been no research done to look at the ramifications of this and how this could affect healing or not. So thinking through, again, using that total liberatory framework, eco-feminism, as well as vegan feminism, that calls for an end to all oppressions, arguing that no attempt to liberate women or any other oppressed groups will be, will be successful without an equal attempt to liberate nature. So potentially if survivors are, are exiting an oppressive system and they're trying to heal, they might not even be aware that if they are consuming products that are connected with oppression, connected with animal liberation, with connected with you know animal agriculture, um, potentially that could be affecting the way that their body and their mind and their spirit is healing. Um, and so that is what my dissertation is is looking at. And I have now um, an exercise that I want us to do, where I'm going to um, read some. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even call it poetry, <laughs> I don't know, prose, <laughs> and then we're going to pause and kind of think through some of these concepts for ourselves and then see how it kind of all comes back together. So this is called um, the prison of crashing down the prison of oppression. I stand at the prison door and through a small jagged hole, I can see you barely breathing. I only see a small rise and fall of the tattered shirt that lays across your chest. Your hair in your face, small and afraid, curled up in the corner of the cell that you've been kept in. As I get closer, I bring myself to the floor and reach my hand through the bars to coax you over to take hold. I don't know what else to do. I cannot get the bars to release. All I know is to be with you and offer my hand. Slowly, inch by inch, you creep towards, sliding on your back as it appears you have been badly injured and cannot stand. Finally, you get to me and our eyes meet and neither of us has to speak. We gaze at one another and we link our breaths and you show me that I am you and you are me. And with each breath, the interlocking oppressions appear with you in the jail. All of those touched 
by sexism, racism, ableism, speciesism, and any other form of oppression lay and half stand with you in this horrific cell. The bars made of patriar patriarchy, heteronormativity, capitalism, indifference, fear, trauma, and generations of pain, not just of the human species, but of all souls and sentient beings and the ecosystems of nature that try their best to support us every day, despite the abuse that has been continually thrust upon them. Who is this girl? And how can I help her and myself and all of us? She says we each must find the key and that each key may look a bit different, but somehow if we seek it and find it and bring it back, it will fit together with other keys to help break these bars that seem impenetrable. I accepted the call that day to find my own key that would fit in a spot to perhaps chip away at the deep depths of oppression, but I walked away not knowing how or what that would look like. So I'm gonna pause here and just invite you to just take a minute and close your eyes and think about if you dropped into the oppressions within your heart, what that might look like for you. As I know that we all have different stories of how oppression and capitalism and all the different isms I just mentioned have affected us. So just take a minute and see what comes to mind for you. Okay, so keeping those in mind, we'll circle back to them when we get to the end here. So as I committed to my own path of healing, I first broke out of the day-to-day -day prison I was living in, in my own abusive partnership that had held me back from stepping into my true self for so long. I left the dogmatic religious tradition I had grown up in that kept me trapped in fear, and I poured my life into working with other survivors of trauma and oppression using the mind-focused modalities I had been taught in my traditional therapist journey training. But I soon found that these techniques only took myself and my clients so far in our journeys of healing. We needed something that truly helped us break the patriarchy and ingrained impression, oppression that literally was pulsing through our blood. So I set out on a journey to explore holistic modalities of healing that supported survivors of intimate partner violence in the healing, not only of their minds, but their bodies and souls. The path took me to yoga, meditation training in Guatemala, exploring healing modalities from ancient traditions, then back to the US, continuing to study techniques such as psychodrama and experiential therapy that helped people to process trauma not only in their minds, but also in their bodies and souls. Along the way, I began to explore the connection between oppression and what one puts in their bodies, which led me to the beautiful path of veganism that offers lifestyle choices with each meal that can support breaking the chain of oppression by choosing not to ingest the pain of animals that have been abused and used all for the gain of capitalism and short-lived pleasure of humans. I began to see the holistic path from what people did outside and inside their bodies as an integral part to healing, but something that many did not believe to be true. Could this be my key? The key I had to offer to the story of breaking oppression? Maybe this one connection I could add to the story to help expand the healing journey of survivors by showing the connection between breaking free from oppression and the choices of what people choose to eat. I was not sure, but I returned to academia to see. And so now I'm still on my journey to find my key, but I leave you here today with some questions to ponder. If you close your eyes and really drop into the deep oppressions within you, what would you find in the prison of your heart? For we have all lived so long under systems of oppression that no one is truly free. And what's more, we are all connected and interconnected in our depths of despair. So if you ask yourself today or whenever your soul begins to beckon, 
what might be the key that you offer to help us all? What might be the key that you offer to chip away at the heavy oppressive systems that continue to try and crush us? And when you find the answer, bring it back to the prison in which humanity waits and join with me and others to demolish the ways of oppression and build a world where we all, where all beings are not just free from a life behind bars, but liberated to step into the full expression of themselves without one drop of oppression left to hold them back. So please join me for now. We know we no longer have to stand at or behind the prison doors, but by joining our ideas together, we can find a way not only of how to open the door, but blow up the whole prison. So I just, I, I'm super um, excited that I found this group. I'm from social work and nobody in social work really that I have found talks about this connection um, between, uh, we talk about multiple oppressions, but we don't link it to how it potentially could be connected um, with animal oppression and speciesism and all of that. And so I don't know exactly how this will all circle up, but I, um, I'm just grateful that there's a platform of people who um, can kind of think outside the box of how potentially these holistic interventions might include thinking about what we're eating as well and the potential healing that that could have for us, as well as, you know, as I was watching everyone's presentation today, it's just amazing to see how I do think that, you know, so many of you are really using your keys to kind of help, help us break this oppression that we're under in humanity. So I'm just grateful for your work and that you have accepted uh, me presenting my work today. And that's all. All right, all right, thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, really wonderful. Honestly, another, um, just engaging presentation that is also as a, a significant non-traditional component as well, and just trying to break barriers in your own sort of realm. So I think that's all excellent. Um, so yeah, we have we have some questions, uh, at least a, a couple here. So um, Emily was wondering a couple things maybe, is, is there a title of the poem? Can you share that or the, the title of the reading um, again or somehow? Yeah, you're muted, Abby. Yeah. Okay, it's called Crashing Down the Prison of Oppression. And yeah, I mean, Emily, if you, here, I, I can just put my email in. If you, if you, if you want a copy of it, of course, I would be willing to share. Um, you can just give me an email. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was Emily's other question about accessing it. So it looks like that'll, that'll work through contact uh, with you at least. Oh yeah, and so, oh yeah, so so Jihan as well, similar, um, asking if there's, uh, are there more of these? And, and Well, I mean, I just wrote this, so I guess there's more in my head, okay. <laughs> but um, I, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm writing a book that includes like my empirical literature as well as like writings and stuff. So to answer that question, yes, but nothing is written down yet. But that's so nice of you that you would let's say you would like to see more. <laughs> uh, oh, didn't see that. Oh, didn't see Emily didn't see the email address. So you might have sent that, Abby, just to all the panelists, possibly. I'm not sure. In the chat, um, in the chat box, uh, changing the, the option to everyone. Maybe. I mean, I, I'm just wondering since I'm a panelist too. I saw it, but that doesn't doesn't help clarify things necessarily. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah how do it I? Was, it was the host and panelists. Yeah. So the attendees can't can't view that. Okay, I'm gonna change it. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. There you go. Good. Excellent. Are there other questions for um, Abby?
Let me check here. Okay. Uh, cool. Well, if not for the moment, you at least have Abby's um, email and some of the others contact info has been sent in the chat as well um, for follow ups. So I think um, I think we can wrap the event up here for now. Uh, so I want to thank all of the presenters um, for being here, for taking the time, for putting in the work. Um, and allowing us to see what you are doing, what you're up to, um, and uh, what you would like us to also experience with you. I also want to thank the audience members um, for participating as well. You're also part of this, um, perhaps asking and commenting, um, but even if not, showing up and listening is, I think, also a form of um, respect and interest. So uh, thanks to all the presenters and the, um, the attendees. Uh, I want to uh, I want to give a particular thanks um, to Sarah Tomasello, who is here um, uh, as well as as a, as a panelist, um, but has been here. So Sarah and I co-organized this from the beginning, um, and so even though I'm the one you end up hearing um, and seeing today between us two, uh, Sarah really helped with all the behind the scenes stuff for months um, in terms of planning, organizing, promoting, and communicating. Um, and so uh, I consider Sarah the, the cornerstone of this event, um, definitely invaluable in helping to put this together. So um, thank you, Sarah, as well. Um, so yeah, in, uh, in uh, soon, a day today or tomorrow, I'm going to try to put this video up on ICAS's YouTube channel. Um, and then I can send all the presenters at least um, the link just so you have it if if you're interested or want to share you know that at all. So um, oh, one thing, one last thing I wanted to put in the chat was just some um, links for critical animal studies sources. So the the three journals, uh, three primary journals of critical animal studies, the flagship journal for critical animal studies, but there's also the peace studies journal and green theory and praxis um, journal all um, housed um, within critical animal studies. And the last link is the uh, YouTube um, account for critical animal studies in general. So uh, you can see previous videos there, see this video there when it, when it goes up, um, as well as of course, explore the other websites. Um, oh, I guess I want to type in the general website for critical animal studies. So you can explore that in another uh, sorts of campaigns and things that um, critical animal studies is involved in. So once again, um, thank you all for being here and I uh, hope to, to continue um, working with, with you all, um, building relationships and, and going forward. So thanks and have a great rest of your, of your days. <laughs>